So, hi, I'm Frank Williams, a, a great supporter of State, Mississippi State University, and uh, one of the sponsors with my wife, Virginia, of the Frank and Virginia Williams Lecture Series on Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War. And today we have uh, Professor Jonathan White, who teaches at um, uh, Christopher Newport University in Virginia to be our uh, fourth lecturer. And I'm welcoming um, uh, Professor White, and uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you and for, for coming me. here. And what is, what is the theme of your lecture that you're going to give later today? I'll be talking about Abraham Lincoln's encounters with African Americans. I've just published a book two days ago about letters that African Americans wrote to Lincoln. The book includes 125 letters. And many of those African Americans also met with Lincoln, even personally delivered their letters. And so I'll be telling some of those stories. Good. That, great. We're looking forward to it. So can, that, that may be a good segue into what do you think the relationship was or know the relationship was between President Lincoln and African Americans? I think that African Americans of the Civil War era, by and large, had a very great fondness and affection for Lincoln. They likened him to Moses or to Jesus Christ. They saw him as a savior. There were some black critics of Lincoln. Frederick Douglass was very critical of Lincoln at various points of the Civil War, and other black abolitionists were as well. But by and large, I think that enslaved people saw Lincoln in very positive terms. And in fact, when Lincoln died in 1865, it was African Americans who wept more bitterly than most white Northerners did, because they knew they had the most to lose in losing him as president. Was this an evolving thing, uh, you know, from not only from them, their point of view, African Americans' point of view, but uh, from Lincoln's point of view, do you think? I think for African Americans, they began to recognize very early in the war that Lincoln's election and that the Civil War itself would bring about new opportunities for freedom. And so in the books that I have, that I just published and another one I have coming out, I describe how as early as Lincoln's inauguration day, there are African Americans celebrating, even refusing to work for their enslavers because they see the ascension of a Republican president as a sign of coming freedom. But from Lincoln's perspective, at the very beginning of the war, he's not fighting for emancipation. Correct. It takes him some time to get to the point that he makes emancipation a war aim. And some African Americans are very frustrated with that. They want Lincoln to push for that earlier. He thinks that it would be politically unwise to push for it too soon. Right. That's, that's I think, exactly right. And, and he had to evolve himself. And, and reunion was the primary goal or mission or aim uh, of the president. Right. And, and, and he said so in his first inaugural address. And then it was only within a year that he changed the, the aim or mission right. to, to emancipation and reunion, and that you couldn't have really a reunion without dealing with, uh, dealing with the issue of bondage. Yeah, that's right. Lincoln always wanted all people of all colors everywhere to be free, and he was very clear about that. He said, I'm naturally anti-slavery. I cannot remember a time when I didn't so think and feel. But Lincoln also didn't believe that just because he was president, he could do whatever he wanted. And he believed that the Constitution protected slavery in the southern states. And so he starts the war by saying, we're fighting for union. Now, at the same time, he's doing what he can early in the war to try to put slavery down. He's fighting the transatlantic slave trade, the illegal slave trade. He's uh, telling his soldiers they can't enforce the Fugitive Slave Act. He's freeing the slaves in Washington. He's trying to get the border states to free the slaves. He's working in ways that he believes he can. But by the summer of 1862, the war is going very badly for the Union, and he comes to the conclusion that the best thing to do is to issue an Emancipation Proclamation. And what that will do is it will take slaves who are being forced to work on behalf of the Confederacy, bring them into the Union war effort, and as a military measure, it will help the Union win the war. And so he really then joins these goals of Union and emancipation so that by preserving the Union, 
you free the slaves, and freeing the slaves will help to preserve the Union. So I think uh, the Emancipation Proclamation may have been one of the first presidential executive orders that we, we are concerned about today yeah. with the number of them and what they affect. Uh, and if it's not uh, usurping what legislative prerogatives there may be. Yeah. But, but Lincoln, um, he did some things that, that, that historically uh, were not so great with African Americans, like when he gathered some of them in the executive mansion, as the White House, not mm -hmm. yet the White House, was called, and, and preached, and he had members of the press there, yeah. and he's preaching and advocating for colonization, right. and w which wasn't going to go anywhere, really. And, and he finally, as John Hay, one of his private secretaries yeah. said, sloughed, sloughed off this yeah. idea of, of emancipation. Of colonization. Of, of colonization, exactly. And um, so what, what's your take on that? Yeah, so on Lincoln's birthday in 2022, I'll be publishing a history of black visitors to the Lincoln White House. And Lincoln began meeting with African Americans at the White House as early as April of 1862. And I have a whole chapter on this meeting in August of 1862, where he invites a delegation of black leaders from Washington to come to the White House. And he very condescendingly lectures them on why they should lead their people out of the country through this process of colonization. And he tries to say, you should go to what is now Panama. And it's this really unfortunate moment, I think, for those of us who love Lincoln. There's a few things that Lincoln said in his career where we wish he hadn't said it, because in this case, he just spoke so condescendingly to this group. But there's a couple ways that I think we can contextualize it. The first is that Lincoln had already decided to issue an Emancipation Proclamation, but for political reasons, he wasn't able to do it yet. And so I think part of what he was doing was he was saying to the American public, I'm trying to do what I can to ease emancipation, and so I'm going to push for colonization. And so he brought in a stenographer, as you mentioned, who wrote down everything he said, and then he published this discourse in the newspapers. And I think that was to try to assuage white northerners. If emancipation comes, maybe it won't be as bad as you think it is. Because again, most of the white northern electorate is white supremacist, very racist, willing to fight for union, but not emancipation. So he's trying to prepare them for that. But another thing that I think is really remarkable about this moment, as condescending as it was, as condescending as Lincoln was, this is the first time in the history of the nation that a sitting president invites a delegation of African Americans to come to the White House to discuss a matter of policy. And so some people looked at this moment in that time and said, you know, this is very condescending. How can the president do this? Other people, Lincoln's critics, looked at it at this time and said, Lincoln is trying to make citizens of these people by giving them this audience in the White House. And I think William Lloyd Garrison, the great abolitionist, captured it where he called it a spectacle as extraordinary as it was humiliating, or maybe it was as humiliating as it was extraordinary. On the one hand, you wish Lincoln didn't say what he did. On the other hand, it was extraordinary for a president to have a meeting like this in the first place. And if you read the Democratic press at the time, they say Lincoln is trying to make African Americans social equals by bringing them into the White House like this. Don't you think, and I think you've alluded to this, that it was just one, um, one um, arrow to the bow on dealing with the issue that he knew we had to resolve uh, if this war was going to uh, be won by, mm -hmm. by the North or we were going to have reunion compensated emancipation mm -hmm. in the states, which didn't go anywhere, right. um, revo revoking General John Fremont's um, order, uh, unilateral order in Missouri, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, General Hunter's order for so the Southeastern Confederacy, yeah. as well as colonization and the, the ultimate uh, uh, emancipation, and then pushing for final freedom with the 13th Amendment because uh, any court could 
could overturn the Emancipation Proclamation as being unconstitutional. Yeah, I mean, Lincoln was a very careful lawyer. And there are a lot of historians who think that he didn't think very deeply about the Constitution, and I think those historians are wrong. I think Lincoln was thinking very carefully about the constitutionality of his actions. And so all of the steps that you took, that you mentioned, he was taking those steps, he was revoking military orders because he was worried Roger Taney, the man who wrote the Dred Scott decision, is still the Chief Justice of the United States. And Lincoln worries that these actions are going to get challenged in the courts, get struck down as unconstitutional, and so he's very careful about how he approaches emancipation so that if it gets challenged in court, it'll get upheld. And ultimately then, it, that's why he wants the 13th Amendment. Right. When the war is over, an Emancipation Proclamation as a military measure is no longer necessary. So he wants the Constitution amended to make freedom permanent. Right, right. And um, is your uh, feeling about this uh, consistent with the, with the attitude of African Americans towards the president? They knew that with his election, they, there was hope on the horizon where there had never been before. Yeah. I think that's right. And by the, by the fall of 1864, when Lincoln is up for re-election, there is a vigorous debate in the black press over do we support Lincoln or do we oppose him? And there were some African Americans who said, look, Lincoln isn't radical enough, he's not doing enough, he's said and done a lot of things that we don't like, we shouldn't support him, we should support a radical like John C. Fremont. There were, I think the majority of African Americans, though, supported Lincoln or they said, we may not be happy with everything he's done, but we need to support a candidate who can win. And Fremont can't win, and Lincoln can, and winning with Lincoln is better than losing with Fremont. We've got to support Lincoln's reelection. And it's an important point, because we often have this sort of myth in our minds that African Americans were not part of the people in the 18th and 19th centuries. The reality is, Black people were eligible to vote in most states in the 1780s when the Constitution is ratified. That right to vote is taken away from them during Jacksonian America, but by the time of the Civil War, five or six states still allow African Americans to vote. And so African American men are voting in a number of northern states, and they can have a say in Lincoln's reelection. And in the book that I published, several of the letters are African American men writing to Lincoln saying, I'm either praying for your re-election or I'm going to vote for you and we support you because you've supported us. Well, tell us about um, Lincoln's own feelings about the franchise, giving the, uh, the election franchise to blacks, to African Americans. Yeah, that's a great question and that's something I'll talk about a good bit this afternoon. Throughout his political career, Lincoln opposed black suffrage. In the 1830s and 1840s, he publicly played the race card in political discourse and talked about opposing black men having the right well, to vote. Because he wouldn't get elected yeah, otherwise. Yeah, I mean, politically right? you could never in the 1830s and 40s support it. R right. In the 1850s, Lincoln begins to talk about the right of self-government and that should include African Americans. At the same time, he says that he's not in favor of making voters of black men. But the Civil War comes around and African American men begin to serve in the army and they serve with valor and distinction. And that begins to push him in a new direction. And in the spring of 1864, several delegations of black men, some who had been born free, some who had been enslaved, come to the White House and they meet with Lincoln. And they say to him, essentially, you should give us the right to vote. And Lincoln's response is, my biggest concern right now is winning the war. If you can show me how giving black men the right to vote will help win the war, then I'll support it. And this one delegation goes away from a meeting at the White House and they write out a new petition where they essentially say that if you give black men the right to vote, when Reconstruction comes, African American voters who have always been loyal will outvote white traitors who've been fighting for disunion. And they go back to the White House and they present a new petition to Lincoln making this argument and Lincoln finds it compelling. And he writes a letter in March of 1864 to the governor-elect of Louisiana, where he says that That's Michael, black, Michael, Michael Hahn, Hahn, yeah, he says that black men who are either educated or who have served in the army should be given the right to vote, Lincoln says, to keep the, the jewel of liberty within the family of freedom. And what that means is that in reunion, black men should be part of the body politic. And Lincoln takes this position privately 
1864, he begins working behind the scenes to try to get black men the right to vote at the state level because the states control the suffrage. But then publicly on April 11th, 1865, he makes this case at a speech in the White House. And in the audience down below the balcony that night is John Wilkes Booth, who says that means N-word citizenship. That'll be the last speech he ever gives. By God, I'll put him through. And then three days later, Booth shoots Lincoln. And so it's that issue of black suffrage that leads ultimately, I think, to Lincoln's assassination, that he was the first president in American history to publicly call for black men to have the right to vote. The abolitionist and agitator, as you call him, and I agree mm -hmm. with you, Frederick Douglass, uh, was, was waiting on January 1, 1863, for Lincoln to yep. sign the final Emancipation Proclamation, right? And, yep. and Lincoln did, uh, did sign it. And what was the relationship between uh, Frederick Douglass and the president? So Douglas was very critical when Lincoln is first inaugurated. He reads Lincoln's first inaugural address and says, Lincoln is abolitionism's worst enemy and the South's greatest slave hound. And he's critical of Lincoln during the war for not doing emancipation more quickly. He's critical of Lincoln in 1863 for not protecting black soldiers from Confederate atrocities. And he boldly goes to the White House in August of 1863 and meets with Lincoln and calls on Lincoln to make sure that black men have equal pay and to protect them from re-enslavement or, or murder if they get captured as prisoners of war on the battlefield. And Lincoln says, you know, essentially I'm doing what I can, but I can't act as quickly as you want me to. And Douglas is not fully satisfied with Lincoln's response, but he begins to appreciate what Lincoln is doing. Summer of 1864 comes around and Lincoln is the Republican nominee for president to be reelected, but the war is going so badly for the Union that Lincoln is convinced he's going to lose. And this time he calls Frederick Douglass to come to the White House in August of 1864. He essentially says the slaves are not, fr are not running away as quickly as we would like. We need to come up with a plan to tell them, run away now run away while I'm in office because as soon as a Democrat beats me and is inaugurated, you're, the Emancipation Proclamation is going to be rescinded and you're not going to be able to become free. And Douglas and Lincoln come up with a plan to carry this out. And Douglas comes away from this second meeting with a new appreciation for Lincoln because when Douglas heard that Lincoln wanted to free the slaves in this way, Douglas saw, okay, this has nothing to do with winning the war, nothing to do with military necessity, everything to do with making freedom as broad and as permanent as possible. And, and Douglas saw in Lincoln a, a new passion that he hadn't seen before that I think had been there all along, but Lincoln couldn't speak publicly that way as a politician. And so Douglas really came to appreciate Lincoln. And, in the aftermath of the war, Douglas gives some speeches praising Lincoln in June of 1865. At, when Lincoln is killed uh, in a eulogy, Douglas calls him emphatically the black man's president. And even at the end of Reconstruction, where Douglas gives a speech that is critical of some of Lincoln's policies, Douglas essentially concedes, my criticism of Lincoln during the war wasn't quite fair. I, I this, wanted certain is this things. Is the, the speech? that he gave at the dedication mm -hmm. of the Freedmen's Monument. In 1876. That, that, was, that was paid for by African Americans. Yeah. yeah, that's right. It's April of 1876, the 11th anniversary of Lincoln's assassination. They erect the statue paid for entirely by African Americans and Douglas gives the address. And, and the opening of the speech, Douglas recounts his criticisms of Lincoln from the war. But then he pivots and he talks about how Lincoln had a constituency that he was accountable to. He had political concerns that abolitionists didn't have to worry about, but Lincoln had to as president. And Douglas yes. essentially concludes that Lincoln's path of prioritizing union is what ultimately made emancipation possible. Excellent. And we can go on forever we because could. we love Abraham Lincoln yeah. and we love the relationship that Lincoln had with African Americans and with the entire nation. Yeah. And so what do you have coming out uh, that the, the public should know, yeah. the people here at State should know? 
So two days ago was the official publication day with U uh, UNC Press, University of North Carolina Press, for a book called To Address You as My Friend, African Americans' Letters to Abraham Lincoln. And I called it To Address You as My Friend because I believe that African Americans came to believe they had a personal connection to Abraham Lincoln. Next month in November, I'm publishing a book with UVA Press called My Work Among the Freedmen. And it's a collection of letters by a woman from Massachusetts who taught former slaves in South Carolina, Virginia, and North Carolina during and after the war. Her most famous student was Robert Smalls, the famous slave who escaped from Charleston and went on to become a congressman after the war. And then on Lincoln's birthday, February 12th, 2022, I'm publishing a book called A House Built by Slaves, African-American Visitors to the Lincoln White House, and that will be with Roman and Littlefield. And so I've got sort of a, a trilogy of books in the next four months that are coming out. You're very busy. I've lost a lot of hair in the last and, few months and, doing and all these is, projects. And this is why uh, Dr. White is uh, a rising star in the middle period history of our country. And so with that, we, we have to say goodbye, but we hope to see uh, Dr. White again and all of you visiting the uh, Lincoln Gallery and the Grant Galleries uh, that are at the Mitchell uh, Memorial University. Thank you.